everyone, and welcome to Path to the Priesthood, the podcast where we will sit down with Greek Orthodox clergy from around the country and ask them about their own personal journeys and paths towards the priesthood and ordained ministry in Christ's church. My name is Christo Papadimus, and I will be your host. And we have a very special first guest for you all today. Uh, please welcome my good friend, Father Christopher Vitellis. Hello, hello. It's a joy to be here. Thank you for thank you for uh, being with us, Father Chris. And before we get into the conversation, we will now hear a few words about Father Chris. Father Chris, being raised in an Orthodox priest household, grew up in different communities throughout the West Coast, which offered him the opportunity to be involved in various ways. He also grew more and more involved with summer camp, and it was especially his involvement with camping and youth ministries that truly sparked the desire for him to pursue a life of service to the church. One of the most profound summer camp experiences for Father Chris, of course, came in the summer of 2009 when he had the opportunity to work as a staff member at the Ionian Village Summer Camp on this later. This is where he not only felt a greater calling to his vocation in the church, but it is also where he met his bride-to-be, Callie, another PK from New York. After graduating from California State University, Sacramento, with a degree in business administration, Father Chris moved to New York and worked for two years as a project estimator at one of Manhattan's largest mechanical and HVAC contracting firms. It was during his time working in New York that Father Chris really started considering and praying a great deal about pursuing his vocation in the priesthood and a life dedicated to the work of the church. After getting married, Father Chris and Callie moved to Boston in the fall of 2012. And with the blessing and guidance of His Eminence Metropolitan Yerasmus of San Francisco, he enrolled and started his studies as a seminarian at Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. Father Chris graduated from Holy Cross in 2016, and shortly thereafter was assigned to be the associate pastor at St. Anthony in Pasadena. After four months of serving the parish of St. Anthony as a deacon, Father Chris was ordained to the Holy Priesthood by the hands of Metropolitan Yerasmus. Father Chris and Presbytera Kali now have three children, Asimina, Dimitri, and Nikos. Father Chris, welcome. Hey, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm honored to be the, the first guest on your podcast. It was smart of you to set the bar really low. <laughs> that way, uh, every further guest will just uh, will be a step up from here on out. That'll be great. No, not at all. Not at all. We're, we're happy to have <laughs> you. And now we heard a lot um, about your about some of your personal history here. But in your own words, Father Chris, we would like to hear what events transpired in your life that eventually led you to first the Holy Cross Seminary in Brookline, Massachusetts, and then on to ordained ministry in Christ Church. So uh, the floor is yours. Take it away, Father Chris. Well, thank you, Christo. And uh, well, it kind of starts with a, a commonality that you and I have. Uh, you and I are both PKs. And so uh, being a PK, well, let me back up. I'll, I'll, I'll sure. forewarn the audience, that is, that uh, my kind of journey to the priesthood, there was no big lightning bolt moment. There was no kind of shocking uh, encounter that, that right. changed yeah, or epiphany or anything like that. I, I wish there was. It would have made it would have made it a lot easier for me, probably. Yeah. But it was like uh, the title of your podcast here. It was a path. It was a it was a journey. It was a lot of uh, prayer and consideration that uh, that I had to kind of go through there. So uh, we'll talk about that. But uh, you and I are both PKs. We're priest kids. Yep. And so being a priest kid, you kind of get to see the kind of background workings of behind the priesthood the in a different, yeah, behind the scenes kind of thing. You see it, you can understand it uh, kind of in a different way, maybe even um, appreciate it in a different way, yep. be able to embrace it. Uh, so being a PK, naturally, uh, I kind of thought about it uh, from a young age. There was kind of a... Uh, curiosity or a, a consideration maybe always in the back of your uh, mind there yeah always in the back of my mind uh but yeah at the beginning kind of thinking i wonder if i could do this i wonder if this is for me right. i wonder if this is uh you know kind of part of my path I'll, albeit that there was there was never any kind of pressure from my dad uh there was no sort of pressure uh or 
anything like that uh, from my father to to go into the, the family business. But um, now, now that's interesting because um, and sorry to interrupt you for a minute, but a lot of people think it's um, almost a non decision sometimes for for the sons of priests, right? It's an automatic thing. Your father's a priest. And so you will one day be a priest, too. And I know I, I receive that question a lot, but uh, it's it's nice to hear that in your case, it was quite the opposite. Right. It was. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and it was the opposite in the sense of from that uh, engagement, that dynamic with my dad. He was never pressuring uh, or anything like that uh, to to pursue a life in the priesthood. But just again, seeing it, being exposed to it, you know, uh, even you know, uh, as I grew up with, uh, yeah, being a little bit more immersed in, in some of the work, right? Being a little right. more involved with it, seeing it, you kind of think, I wonder if, I wonder if this is for me. Uh, but there was a little bit of that kind of, um, it felt like a fallback uh, in a way, which was unique, uh, which was kind of part of that journey as well, because for a time it did feel like, okay, maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just go into the priesthood. I've seen it. I'm kind of accustomed to it. Uh, it seems like something that I could do. It's right? always there, right? It's like, you're right. It's always, right. Yeah, it's always there. It's always kind of. Uh, I, I'm comfortable with it right now. So it was almost like a why not. Now, I'll pause there because all of those reasons I just stated, for me at least, and I think for most people, were kind of the wrong reasons. This isn't a, this isn't a calling that you just fall back on, Correct. right? So, uh, you know, in my adolescence, in my, in my youth, there was, a, there was a kind of trying to curb that anxiety of selecting a vocation or that kind of pressure, that anxiety that a lot of young people have about what am I going to do with my life? What's my right. career? What's my calling? Right. This kind of thing. So, uh, from a younger age, I kind of, I, I, I kind of tried to uh, escape those anxieties or those, those kind of pressures by saying, you know what? I'll just be a priest. I'll uh -huh. just be a priest. I'll just go into the priesthood, right? I, I, know, I, I know it. I can do it. I think I can do it. It seems like a job I can do. That kind of thing. I saw it as a job. I thought as a, as just a career path that I was sure, accustomed when, to, and I said, you're at that, "I'll go for it." Life, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll just go for that. I don't want to have to think about any other career, right? Again, all the wrong reasons. Um, but those were that's kind of the uh, kind of what was going on in the back of my mind, being being a PK. So then, now, um, can I ask what age yeah. this was? Was this high school? Was this uh, this was probably. This was probably middle school, early high middle school, school years. So as early as middle school, right, kids are feeling pressure to have like a whole life path planned out to know what you will be even from middle school. That's that's interesting and, and, and that's very true. So these these are, all these um, impressions are kind of, and thoughts are swirling around as early as middle school. That's interesting. Okay, sorry, continue. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, we see that even, I think even more so today with the, the kids today and not to go off on too much of a tangent, but I mean, we you, you see it in your, youth work as well, freshmen and sophomores in high school, it's like they're, they're pressured to plan out the rest, the next 20 years of their life. For sure. Pick the college, depending on the major, depending on the career, depending on, you know, like all these things, you got to pick it now and, and that's your trajectory. Stick right to there. it. Right, right. Yeah, just stick to it. So uh, I didn't, I don't think when I was in, in high school that that pressure was as, as much as the kids today, but uh, it still was there, that kind of anxiety, that, that pressure to, to know where you're going to go. So that was my, I just, I just went with a fallback plan at the, at the, in my mind at that time, right? Right. Growing through that, going out of uh, high school uh, into college, uh, it came pretty clear that those were not the right reasons. Yes. So actually later in high school, early years of college, that's when I really said, okay, this is not for me. I'm not just going to go be a priest because I am comfortable with it. So I really wrote it off. I, I, I thought it was not at all my path. I said, nope, not happening. Uh, let me just get a uh, business degree, as you as you mentioned yeah. in the bio. Let me just get a degree. I'll find a job somewhere. My job doesn't define me. This kind of thing doesn't matter what I'm going to do. But it's not the priesthood. I'm not going to. That's not my path. Um, I didn't have it in my heart, in the right way at the time. Uh, so yeah, again, college time. That's when I just said, out, not happening. Straight business world is right. Right. This I'm going to like you said. Just stick to the. I'm just going to find some career. Yeah. Get the paycheck get it done, uh, everything else will fall into place, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's when um, it was around this time, later on in, uh, towards the end of college where I was going to Sacramento State, uh, that I went to 
I was always involved with summer camp ministries, uh, St. Nicholas Ranch. That's right. Uh, camp, camp Angelus up in uh, Portland, Oregon. Yeah. Um, I went as a camper uh, to Ionian Village in 2003. Oh, cool. uh, and that was an impactful summer for me as well. But uh, so much more so was the summer that I went as a staff member sure. in 2009. Sure. Uh, in 2009, which is uh, where I met my wife. Uh, so it was impactful uh, there, of sure. course, but that's also uh, where I would say through the experience of being in a more, you know, as a camper, you get to experience it in a certain light. As a staff member, you get to experience it in a, in a, in a different kind of engagement. Totally in, different. I would, in, I would argue like almost night and day, even though physically the camps are the same places, it's, right. it's a completely different experience from a uh, camper to counselor or staff member. So that's, um, that's always. Yeah, so being like being kind of thrust into that le leadership position of ministering and, you know, leading discussions and things like this, leading um, these trips or these little pilgrimages, that's what I call them for Amian Village when we're visiting monasteries and so they totally were pilgrimages like the they first really are pilgrim. entry level yeah. pilgrimage before right before holy lands and right that's what i remind you of the, the parents as well you know you're sending these kids on a on a trip to greece yes but it really is a spiritual pilgrimage it's a journey for them it's beautiful for sure uh but that summer was you know those two months that we spent there was very impactful for me and that's where i would say the the seed was the kind of new seed was planted in my heart to really consider um this as a uh, as a vocation as a as a calling um and actually i'll reflect a little bit about that in the sense of uh at the end of the summer uh at that summer there were uh we had father mark leondis who was the then uh national youth and young adult uh director for the archdiocese he was there as kind of a co-director position, and then also Father Jason Roll was the director back then. As well. It was Father Jason when you went as a counselor. Father Jason, that was his that was his first year as a full time director, I think at that at that time. That's awesome. Yeah, so we had a, we had a great staff, a great group, great directors, um, and I remember at the end of the uh, at the end of the camp sessions when it was just the staff. You know, we have the camp cleanup time. We kind of wrap yeah. up a uh, few days with just the staff. Just the, the orientation or whatever they call it. Yeah. The or, yeah, exactly. Uh, we had the opportunity to go. We all went out to dinner somewhere, uh, some local town. And Father Mark and Father Jason kind of pulled me aside. And they were they were rather direct and rather stern with me. Really? In the sense of they, they kind of told me about, you know, the school, about uh, pursuing a life in the priesthood. They were essentially saying, we see this in you. We wow. want you to really consider it. We, we, we think this is something you need to consider. Um, and uh, I mean, the conversation was longer than that, but they were very direct and almost like a, in a loving pastoral, but uh, uh, a little bit stern way of like That's saying, it. you got to go do this. Uh, and <laughs> said, well, okay. Um, so the, the seed was planted and then they were like just planting it down <laughs> even more. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's amazing. Cause um, you know, anyone who knows Father Jason knows that he's a very um, people-oriented person. He has a very yeah. um, impactful way about him. And actually, and that, it was um, thanks to Father Jason that I was first introduced to Ionian Village. And then I returned later to have um, my own experiences as well. But um, but that's a very meaningful thing to happen. I assume you were in college during this time, right? You were college. Yeah. So to be, you know, college-age kid and have um, not only one, but two priests um, who are in like the the top leadership role at Ionian Village to validate, you know, something that maybe the seed had been planted that summer, but had always been there from your youth and to maybe validate and renew these feelings that you've been um, feeling. That's kind of amazing. And we always say that God works through people. So I wonder if maybe he was perhaps working through Father Jason and Father Mark, you said was the other. Yeah. Yeah. Father Mark. That, that's pretty cool. So, okay. So you're at Ionian Village. Um, it was uh, an awesome summer. Met your wife. You connected with two um, two clergymen who who saw something in you clearly. And then what did you do? So the summer wraps up. I go back home to Sacramento. Uh, Callie's from New York. Yes, I'm from Sacramento at the time. So we were uh, dating cross country uh, for a year. I had one more year of undergraduate studies at Sacramento State. Um, uh, seeing that I was enamored with this other PK across the across oh. the country in New York. I said, I graduated. I said, all right, I'll move to New York. 
she was not willing to uh, move to uh, outside of New York at the time. And here we are in Southern California, by the way. That is um, hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, so I moved to New York and uh, again, the seed was planted, but maybe we could say it wasn't quite sprouted yet. It wasn't quite uh, flourishing yet. So I, I moved to New York just thinking, again, I'm just going to go get a job. This is where, you know, I'm going to close the, the long distance gap. Uh, we right. knew we were going to get married. It was really like a kind of time warp of uh, falling in love at camp kind of thing that uh, a lot of camp couples can attest to. But um, um, moved to New York uh, and I started, uh, I just found a job there. I just really just, I found a job. Uh, and with a with an amazing company called PJ Mechanical, they were the, uh, at the time, and I think they might still be uh, the largest HVAC uh, mechanical contracting uh, company, a construction company uh, in New York City. Uh, and the reason I was able to just get a job there is there was it's a it's a Greek owned company, uh, and there's a number of Greeks in the company. That's awesome. And um, one of the kind of uh, higher position people was actually uh, a seminarian graduate as well. So uh, no way. Knew, my father-in-law uh, uh, knew my dad, things like that. So, uh, you know, you know the right people, you get a job. So I started working in a, in a field that I had no experience in. Oh, wow. um, mechanical engineering, kind of, uh, I was an estimator. I was looking at these big mechanical kind of architectural drawings, <laughs> taking oh. estimates, doing all these things. Uh, not in my, my wheelhouse there. So um, I was working and it was a good job. It was a good can company. I, can I ask a good question? Oh yeah, this. go ahead. Because I believe we talked about this. I, I don't know. I don't think I've mentioned this yet, but we actually, Father Chris and I overlapped at the seminary. Father Chris was two years ahead of me and I, I came in um, two years into his time there. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, did you work in a cubicle at one point? Yes. Was it? <laughs> okay, so. Very but, much a cubicle. Very much a cubicle. And what I love about <laughs> this is that, um, you know, something I think that, um, and it's natural that people, they look at their priest a certain way, but sometimes they forget that they've had very relatable experiences to um, their flock, to the people in the pews where it's, and I don't, I can't think of anything more relatable than a working in a cubicle, right? So when you, <laughs> you told me that at the seminary, it was just kind of this like, wow, so he was in uh, a cubicle. In other words, kind of just like everybody else, right? So it's, um, it's just something that kind of helps uh, put the priest into human terms for people sometimes, knowing that they've worked uh, previous jobs. My dad used to work for John Deere Tractors um, before oh, he was go. a priest because, you know, of course, being from Illinois, that was the industry. So oftentimes our priests are very um, relatable to us in ways we might not know. So anyway, sorry for that. I don't know why well, you're yeah. certain things, but just the, I just wanted to um, <laughs> follow up on that. So uh, continue. Yeah. So I was working there. Uh, again, good job, a good kind of entry level position. Um, uh, but that was really where, I, what's that? And enjoying my eight by eight cubicle, no windows. Um, it was, you know, in the, in the winters in New York, it was, you know, you get about, you know, four hours of sunlight. Right. And so sometimes I wouldn't go outside for lunch. So I would arrive at the office and it was dark. And I would leave the office and it would be dark, dark again. So I would never see the sun. Wow. Uh, during those winters sometimes but um uh but again a great job great people around me uh, great opportunity um pretty well paying too for an entry-level position so i was happy in those those senses I, I checked all the boxes off in terms of all right career uh found a woman i love you know, yeah. all these kinds of things and um all the opportunity was there but i was um really shaken up knowing that it, this was not the path for me I didn't know what it was. And sometimes I would be really kind of miserable huh. um, uh, saying that I was really struggling with this. You know, I was, it wasn't that I wasn't happy. I wasn't going to just leave a job just because I wasn't happy. I didn't want to be the quintessential millennial who just jumps from job to job. Right. But right. Um, so I stuck it out for two years and, and it was those two years that was just that again, where I talked about before, I didn't have the light and bolt moment, but it was, it was an arduous kind of, it was a journey. It was a path. During those two years was just a lot of prayer, a lot of contemplation, and a lot of leaning on people that I knew, that I loved, and that I trusted uh, to kind of have these long conversations with. Yeah. Now, in fairness, my wife, my now wife, uh, knew plenty well before me uh, that it was going to be the seminary, it was going to be the priesthood. She was Wait. waiting for me to kind of catch no up. No way. So Callie. Yeah, she wasn't. She wasn't shocked when I when I you know <laughs> made the call. She's like, okay, okay. It's about time. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. No um, way. 
but that's really what it was. It was, a, it was really a lot of kind of painful prayer, yeah. uh, a lot of uh, deep consideration, contemplation. And again, I, one of the big takeaways is I was, I was leaning on the people that I knew I loved, I could trust that, that knew me. It was kind of a, it could, I could reflect with uh, a that's, little bit. That's amazing. And, and so to wrap up that kind of chapter, what's funny is, uh, again, like I said before, it's a good entry level job. Could have climbed the ladder. I'd be doing pretty well if I stayed at that job. But now, by all twelve means. years later, twelve years later, I'd be I'd be, I'd be uh, sitting pretty probably. But um, who knows? But what's funny is when I kind of made the decision, I had the kind of clarity uh, to know that we'd be pursuing uh, a life of the ministry, a life of the priesthood. I I called my boss, the CEO of the company, and I, and I said, you know, I'd like to meet with you. Oh. going to the office and he says you know i've been meaning guy? to meet with you. what's that is this the greek guy that owned the company yeah yeah probably. he still does yeah yeah uh and and so i i call him and i say i like to meet you and he says something along the lines of yeah i've been meaning to meet with you as well i said okay so oh. i go into the office and him being the boss i, I let him go first and sure. so he he says uh you know you've been doing a great job in estimating department and i said okay I don't know what I'm doing, but apparently, um, <laughs> the office, like literally in the office. Yeah. 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 And so, uh, and we, he, his intention was uh, during this meeting was to promote me from the estimating department to become a project site manager, to be on site wow. for the actual oh. projects and stuff like that. And I said, I actually have a different plan. And so I told him that, uh, I'd actually be quitting wow. <laughs> in a few months time. And then I would be pursuing, uh, the seminary and the priesthood. And uh, it, this is someone who's involved with his parish back home. Oh, okay. So he was, under, he was fully okay. understanding and everything. It was that just helped. funny, the timing of which, you know, he, he calls me in for, for a promotion. I said, I'm actually going to be leaving. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now that's amazing. And this kind of, um, this kind of segues already into, into one of the questions I wanted to ask you. Um, how much of a decision to to pursue the priesthood or to go to the seminary was a spiritual decision. How much of it would you say was an intellectual decision? And if it was both, like, how do you think the two work together? Because um, I think we we often find the coming together of those two things um, a lot in life and not just big life decisions, but just overall outlook on how we approach um, challenges or things that come up. So for you, um, I know you mentioned that you had um, a lot of many periods of prayer. And um, so just, I'd like to hear a bit about um, the spiritual side versus the intellectual side of your decision to uh, attend the seminary. Yeah, so I mean, in terms of, yeah, making that decision to attend the seminary, it was really more of the decision to pursue the priesthood. Okay. Uh, which, which of course was a, was, was much more a spiritual decision. But uh, I also don't, I don't, really separate too much the intellectual with the spiritual the mental with the ah. uh, physical and things like that as well so um it was the decision to pursue the priesthood that i had to come to terms with and really uh commit to uh at the same time you know some of the the priests that i spoke with family members that i spoke with you know said don't put too much pressure on that because you can go to school and if you get some clarity while you're at the seminary that this isn't your calling Glory to God. That's that's the clarity that you the clarity that you need as well. So right. uh, I understood that as well. That that the four years of seminary would and they and they were uh, would be a journey uh, as well towards the priesthood. But uh, yeah, it was definitely a spiritual consideration and decision. Uh, it was logical also, uh, in or intellectual logical in the sense of um, I had to go to seminary to pursue right. the priesthood. So <laughs> right. it was kind of a prerequisite there that I did have to. Uh, uh, go with too. So I would say it was definitely a combination of both. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. And now during your time at the seminary, what would you say were the things that you um, enjoyed most about the seminary? What are like, in other words, what are some of the things that you miss about the seminary that you were, wish were maybe still a part of your life or just, um, you know, fond experiences that you had that were unique to the seminary? Well, I know of one that was not, and uh, you'll, it's one that you'll agree with. It was the six months of winter. That Dude, was, uh, not... <laughs> for us West Coast people, yeah, that's a, that is a serious life adjustment, man. It was, yes. <laughs> and yeah, that, yeah, you were talking about not seeing the sun earlier. And um, <laughs> yeah, at the seminary, I remember like you're, you're in classrooms 
and we're talking the dead of winter now where like at the height of daylight it's really just kind of a gray fog in the air like yeah, the, sun, yeah. Break through the clouds and that really is quite an adjustment um, it was an adjustment i enjoyed the snow and i enjoyed the winters sure. but by the end of the four years i was like okay this is these are long winters and for my i don't know call me a softy west coaster or something like that but yeah. <laughs> that was definitely an adjustment but i did enjoy it too at the same time but yeah definitely i think uh a common theme that you'll probably see in a lot of these interviews in terms of this question of the favorite aspects of the seminary uh, would be the, the sense of community that's there yeah. And, yeah. and connectivity. Um, uh, that's where, I mean, there's, a, there's really a, is a beautiful uh, brotherhood that, that comes with a life in ministry. Uh, not even just a brotherhood within with priest to priest. That is a unique one as well, but sure. uh, just parish leadership. Um, that is shared. And so that connectivity and that community uh, within your class, within, uh, within the, the campus, uh, I really enjoyed and I like, I love the accessibility of it too. The school is small enough ah. uh, and intimate enough in, in which you can, you know, knock on a professor's door and be able to sit with them for an extended period of time and ask a lot of questions and have good conversations. That's not something that can be done at a big university. No. Uh, so the act, the accessibility, the that uh, you know, intimate smaller campus has, has a lot of benefits as well. Uh, but also, um, kind of tied at the top with that community aspect uh, was the chapel. Was Dude. would be the presence of the chapel there. Yeah. Uh, daily services at the chapel. Uh, that that was really the place of, with the whole campus as well. But the chapel was really a place of formation. A place of of prayer, uh, a place of a place of challenge as well, uh, being in the chapel. Uh, but and that kind of gets me to the to the kind of the highlight that I would another highlight that I would recall of uh, life at the seminary was was the challenges there. Um, the, the, the challenges maybe they weren't enjoyable in and of the, right there. It wasn't not everything's a party, of course. That's that's life. But right. the challenges were were formational they were they were beneficial they were uh part of kind of developing that mindset of of, of a life uh in service and a Being life of outside yourself yeah right for for a life of ministry and that's that's interesting about the chapel because whether actively or passively passively being sitting in the pews um and and during orthos and vespers or actively um either at the chant stand or in the altar service group or later i believe you were ordained as a deacon your senior year so you served as a yeah. deacon in the chapel as well which is probably a very unique experience that you'll remember for a long time um the services in the chapel i would say are probably unique to any other services in the entire country right you have mm -hmm. um chant groups that are led by you know experts professors um, you have not only a chaplain, but a variety of different clergy where um, seminarians are able to experience different liturgical styles, different um, forms of preaching, all, all different kinds of things, all in one beautiful little chapel. And uh, you were speaking about the size of the campus of the seminary earlier. And my first visit, I, I was... I was shocked. My dad drove me around the campus and he said, hey, there's the chapel and there's the classroom building. And that was, that's pretty much like, those are those are the two places you yeah. spend uh, most of your time. And um, I remember being shocked at how, how small the campus was, but then um, how impactful, just because physically the, the space isn't large, like we're used to big, you know, universities, state schools and stuff like that in California. Um, but the, the impact can be so much more profound. And that is, uh, you know, embodied by that beautiful little chapel there. And it's, uh, uh, I haven't been back since graduation. Um, have you been, have you returned? Since I graduated, I was back there for uh, clergy lady. Oh, nice. 18, cool. was able to go back to the, to the chapel there and visit the campus for a little bit. Uh, but yeah, that it really is a unique place. And I love that you mentioned about the, you know, the chant groups and uh, different priests that serve there. Cause it's, it's beautiful in the sense of everything is kind of, has its proper place and it's done kind of more uh, lofty and beautifully, but it's also, there's a little bit of struggle within there too, because we're students. Yeah. So it's the, chant, the chant groups are beautiful, but then it comes time that someone tries to start chanting and they're still learning. So it's not, it's not, you know, 
uh, CD quality or, you know, we have, <laughs> dude, to, it's the, not. We have it, to read the Psalms for the first time and dude. we're stumbling over the Greek. And, and that's, that was part of the beauty too, though, is because we're all students in there. There was no embarrassment or, uh, you know, maybe a little bit, but, uh, but it, it naturally, still, yeah. And so if I, if I may, actually, because uh, you mentioned the reading of the Psalms in Greek, and although we were different years at the seminary, your chant group can be made up of people from different years. You were yeah. in my chant group, and uh, it was my turn to read the Psalm for, uh, for Vespers in Greek. And, you know, I, yeah. I practiced it at the beginning. The beginning goes well, but by the end, you know, it became more and more difficult. And, yeah. uh, you know, I kind of lost, uh, lost a few words here and there. And you're right, when, when you're done, even though we are all students, there's the pressure to, you know, excel and show that we're, we're making progress and all these things. And I was, uh, I, was, uh, I was pretty bummed by my performance at the end of, of the psalm. <laughs> and you patted me on the back and you said, bravo! And like, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> And I, and I think about that um, from time to time, because, you know, we still, when we get into the parishes, we're not perfectly polished either. I suppose it's the beauty of- I was just glad that I didn't have to read it. So I said, you know, <laughs> bravo for you having to do it. <laughs> exactly. But those, those little experiences and those little pats on the back from your, your classmates or schoolmates can carry you, you know, well into ministry. So that's, um, that's, that's something special about the, uh, the, you know, the chapel life there too. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. So now- um, we've talked about the things that you miss from the seminary and the things that were challenging. Um, how would you say, when you were at the seminary, how would you say uh, you envisioned ordained ministry and um, work in the parish? And um, now that you are a uh, proistominos or presiding pastor yourself of St. John the Baptist Greek Orthodox Church in Anaheim, California, um, how would you say your perception of uh, parish ministry differed at the seminary than it does now that you are in the role? Or how has it lived up to your perception at the seminary? How have did things at the seminary um, prepare you for what you are um, working with now? Well, so much of the life of the seminary was was really perfect for um, beginning that life of ministry, a parish ministry, because because of the challenges that that came about there. Um, I, I would say though that some of the kind of differences came when when you when you get down uh, when you get down to it, when you're in the weeds, when you're Sure. Because because at the seminary you have ideas, you know you're 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 you got rose colored glasses when you're graduated. You oh, have sure. all the ideas. The world is the, at your fingertips. That, yeah. Everything is yeah. going to happen this way. And I'm, they I, told I me it would be this way. Yeah, I know what to expect. Yes. I, I'm done learning. I've I've taken all my classes. There's no more yep. learning. What what more is there to learn? Yeah, right, right. I got my I got my degree. I'm a theologian, and so let me go out there and do the, You know, so uh, yeah, that. That comes crashing in a sense, but um, uh, again, in a beautiful way. And I think um, uh, I was fortunate that, you know, because some senior priests uh, can be a little jaded sometimes. I'll say yeah. that. I don't think I don't think anyone's shocked by that. Uh, I was very fortunate in my uh, four and a half years, almost five years serving in uh, Pasadena to uh, uh, be under the wing of a senior priest who uh, really was not like that in the sense, uh, Father Peter Stratus. Who's still in Pasadena? Uh, he allowed me the freedom to uh, try new ideas, to try new ministry ideas, to kind of um, apply myself where where I might be excited to to try new things and yeah. uh, this and that. So that was a beautiful opportunity where I think um, you know if it so happens that it, down the road I I find myself in the position of being senior priest with an associate or an assistant uh, I'm going to remind myself of, of, of that that uh, you know, I might be a little more jaded coming down the years but not to stifle the young one who's who's enthusiastic and who's who's got great there ideas go. and, you know not to just uh, not to just push that aside say oh you don't know yet you don't know how it's going to be or, you know, anything right like that. So, right right uh, I was very thankful for that opportunity um that is amazing you know. because that's a that's a crucial time right there after seminary, right? Um, everybody has their um, different expectations of what a new um, second priest or assistant priest's roles and responsibilities are. So for for Father Peter to give you the um, give you the freedom to you know find that 
rhythm in your in your own personal ministry knowing that he has his ministry but you are beginning your own unique ministry though of mm -hmm. course you are you are there to assist him in his ministry yours is just beginning and that is um that's very cool that he gave you that um freedom and ability to 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 find your own road so that's that's cool too yeah it was beautiful because like you said i i, I became a deacon while i was still a senior uh in my fourth year at the seminary and so um I was able to serve as a deacon at the school. I graduated in 2016, and then I started uh, uh, in Pasadena as a deacon okay. and became a priest uh, there. Uh, Pasadena, which is the home of the Rose Bowl. Um, yeah, right. and I, but that, yeah, that's where I was able to uh, help with the many ministries, uh, support the kind of youth ministries, uh, support the priests, of course. And uh, what's, I mean, uh, prevalent to our time today is that at, towards the end of my time there, I was also there to uh, serve with Father Peter and serve as the, as, um, uh, serve the community of, of St. Anthony's uh, in the depths of COVID. Uh, you know, oh, and, so and everything really shut down. Were you in Pasadena? You were in Pasadena during COVID. Man, my, my timeline yeah. all thrown off. But the, yeah. transition, the transition happened from Pasadena to Anaheim right in the middle of it, 2000, 2021. I started here in uh, St. John's in Anaheim. Um, we started mid COVID. The services were still outside in our parking lot. Whoa, that's my first, right. Yeah, so my first liturgy here in Anaheim was uh, uh, St. Basil's uh, liturgy, January 1st, 2021. Right outside, we had two big, beautiful tents out here. 150 people showed up outside in the cold, um, but it was beautiful. And so that kind of, that was a unique transition that that is. It was on nobody's radar for uh, <laughs> our time in seminar, our time in seminary. Yeah, I don't but, think we talked about that. Uh, yeah, it's no, seminary. We, we had pandemic preparation uh, during our time in seminary. I don't oh, think yeah. so at all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was, uh, yeah, but um, I'm not really sure what kind of like expectations I had coming out of uh, seminary. You know, there's certain excitements, but uh, uh, certain maybe high hopes or enthusiasm that uh needed to be curbed a bit but sure uh sometimes we do expect that kind of that like montage moment that things are just going to happen like ba 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 yeah 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 you this know, is the defining rock, moment in my ministry this is a defining moment i'm doing or, no I, you had this picture of really like things are going to go this way and it's just okay. going to be the sequence of like rapid fire things like you know picture the rocky training montage and like, oh, okay you know, that, the that montage takes takes uh takes you know, two minutes and 30 seconds. Right. Uh, but in reality, that's not how things work out. That's not how, you know, you gotta, it's a grind. It's a, it's a process. It's a, uh, it's, yeah, it's a process in there, but there's, there's, there's really a lot more authentic uh, and lasting joy in that too. Uh, yeah. in, in working through that grind and working through it and not just being like, all right, I'm going to get there and youth ministry is going to be like this and then we're going to have these activities and bam, bam, bam. Everything is going to uh, be good. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Very good. And that kind of, um, that kind of goes into our, the next thing that we wanted to talk about. And that is what for you are the greatest joys of the priesthood or ordained ministry? And if, and if not joys specifically, um, you know, each priest kind of has their, forte for or you know area of focus that's important to them whether it be camping ministries uh youth ministries teleturgics uh visiting chant like there's something that that each priest kind of um you know places a little more emphasis emphasis on for their own natural um you know for you father chris what what are the greatest joys of the priesthood or what are your um what are your areas of extra interest shall we say uh, i would say the, the sacramental liturgical life is 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 definitely one of the greatest joys. Um, that's why I I personally, again, this might be the the six year priest with the rose colored glasses. Sure. I I still personally look forward to Holy Week every year well, yeah. because the parishioners know they're not going to call the priest for meetings. They're not going to call the priest for uh, all these kinds of uh, extracurricular yeah. things during Holy Week because they know how busy the priest is during Holy Week. So during Holy Week, the priest gets to be a priest in the sense of you're just serving the services. Yep. You're being the, the liturgical minister of the uh, of the congregation. And so that is a, that is an absolute joy for me to offer the sacraments, to offer uh, the, the wedding service and what comes with that and working with. I actually have a couple coming in uh, tonight in about 15 minutes to oh, no do their premarital counseling. And so that's a joyous process as well. Um, baptisms, of course. It, 
you know what I would say when when kind of contemplating that, what's a, some of the greatest joys, or maybe I could say the greatest kind of fulfillment uh, to see uh, in the priesthood. Uh, actually, it might seem strange, but it comes in the in the sacrament of confession. Oh. Uh, not that you know you're overjoyed in hearing the things that the the penitent is saying, but you see someone coming back into the fold. You see someone repenting. You see someone like the prodigal son coming to their right mind and coming back into the father's house. And that is absolutely joyful. That is, it is, it is a beautiful thing to uh, be a witness to, to administer that sacrament. Yeah. Um, and it's a beautiful thing to, to counsel someone with and, and to be, to co-suffer with them uh, in those moments and to see them uh, renewed, forgiven, yeah. uh, uh, repentant, and brought back into uh, the life of the church in these kinds of ways. So that's that's um, that's that's with amazing. that. I mean, yeah. I'm, glad you, I'm glad you touched on confession there because um, you know you hear you hear a lot of the times that oh yes, as a priest you're you're present for the most joyous occasions uh, in people's lives, and we usually talk about weddings and baptisms, right? Mm -hmm. And along with weddings and baptisms, of course, are are joyful and, and a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of you know celebrations, receptions, partying, and music, and and celebration of the sacrament that took place because it is a joyous moment. Confession, on the other hand, is quite the opposite in terms of um, there is there's the opposite of fanfare and celebration. It's a mm -hmm. it's a very private um a very private sacrament and um you know oftentimes people leave uh the church when when um someone is coming to meet the priest for confession and so usually we associate confession um kind of with like a more like a sadder um undertone as opposed to like a joyous thing and you know when you're a kid you have your holy friday or we did lazarus saturday like youth retreats and that's when yeah. we would all like go to confession or summer camps a lot of time um the kids have like scheduled times where you can go to confession and everyone stresses about it everyone's kind of like nervous yeah. about it it's like uh it's a it's this intimidating thing but it is um much more than all those other things, a beautiful thing. It is a joyous yeah. thing. It is, it is what we are, what we are all about in our faith and the life of the church. So I'm, I'm glad you, um, I'm glad you touched on that because uh, I, you know, I, I have to say myself, like I always thought weddings and baptisms, but there is probably nothing purer than the joy of someone who's come for uh, the sacrament of confession. Very cool. Yeah. 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 Cool. So those were um, those were your your greatest joys and the things you enjoy most about the priesthood. And we have we have a few minutes left. I know you have a couple coming, and we have about we have a few minutes before our hour finishes up. But uh, before we go, you know, I must ask you uh, about your <laughs> hobbies when you're not at the church, when you need, when you are not uh, serving the services, when you're not meeting with couples for. Um, for wedding classes and things like that. What is Father Chris Rotella's doing in his time outside of the church? And, uh, and I'll let you go because uh, I'll let you um, put it in your own words, but uh, I know one hobby you have that I wanna ask you about specifically. Okay, well, uh, you mentioned at the beginning of my bio and I'll remind everybody that I do have three kids. So yeah. free times and hobbies are, are, are sparse, but uh, I'm sure, yeah. uh, I, do, I do love to cook. Um, and I love to eat, which is connected to that other hobby that we're going to talk about. <laughs> yeah, sure. uh, so I love grilling. I just bought a smoker last week. So I've been no learning how to do it, uh, work with a smoker, and smoke meats, things like that. Going full dad mode, right? <laughs> uh, with the smoker now. You got to wear the white New Balance with the full full length socks. And apron like that, with like a cheesy it. joke. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's nice. I mean, I, I live in Southern California, so it's nice for that to be able to grill 12 months out of the year and do these kinds of things. But uh, Outside of that, um, you know, it's 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 weird to call it a hobby, but it is a, a good habit that I've, I've I started to build up. And you and I uh, have been in these challenges together is uh, working on fitness, physical yeah. wellness, and, and fitness as well, uh, which has been an, which has been a, a journey for me. Again, a long journey for me, uh, a, really a renewed journey uh, for the past, I would say, you know, two plus years. Yeah. Uh, because uh, in 2019, I weighed uh, over 300 pounds, and that was always uh, that was kind of an eye-opening moment for me. Yeah, uh, I had always struggled with my weight, always struggled with eating habits and things like that. Uh, that was always a bit of a struggle for me. But um, to build up the good habits 
uh, consistency and really, I mean, the, the word is the good discipline. Yeah. Um, and this is where, uh, you know, our friend Jocko Willink yeah. uh, comes in and I love his quote uh, that he uses so often, that, uh, discipline equals freedom. Yep. And when he first said that, I said, okay, Jocko is probably orthodox because that's so, <laughs> uh, so our mindset, right? We yeah. embrace discipline. We, em we embrace it in the sense of it's actually freeing. It's actually liberating. The yes. discipline of fasting is so that we are not enslaved to our stomachs. Right. Uh, the discipline of prayer is so that we aren't enslaved to the, the thoughts, the logis me, the kind of things that swirl around us in this world. Yeah. Uh, so the discipline of uh, eating right and, and working out consistently, um, whatever that might look like. You know, I like doing weightlifting, strength training, things like that. But yeah. Sometimes I ride bikes. Sometimes I, I run every now. I don't run like you do, but uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, that's been a beautiful um, growth journey for me because uh, it's it's been a beautiful discipline to uh, to work on. Again, it ebbs and flows. Yeah. Uh, you know, we all know the the yo yo that we see on the scale, and we we see yeah. the weight go down, and then we go back up, and we kind of we co struggle with that as well. But um, yeah. uh, there really is. I mean, there's such a direct correlation a beautiful relationship that comes with the uh, spiritual life and um the physical our physical well-being as well again sure. we talked about it before. we don't separate our minds and our our, our souls and our, and our bodies as right. these kind of separate things they are we are we are one we are we see it in a more holistic way it's a very direct relationship that we um and i see it very evident when my when my prayer life is more disciplined and built up and regular and, and, and uh, structured, it lends itself right into uh, a better, uh, better fitness habits, better physical uh, habits, better, better eating habits as well. And vice versa. When I'm honed in on working out every day, waking up early, working out in the morning before the kids get up, uh, eating right throughout the day, I notice that I'm, I'm more prone to prayer. Yeah, I'm more uh, uh, regular in my prayer life as well. All these things are kind of um, intertwined together. I'm more attentive to my family. Yeah, I'm more attentive to my parishioners, to my to my work here uh, at the church. All of these things. So uh, it's a beautiful thing to see, and I'm I'm thankful for uh, you know you and I. We've been uh, with with a number of uh, of brothers as well from the seminary. Yeah. We've been challenging each other's different challenges and weight loss challenges, sharing your workouts and things like that. It's a beautiful thing to, uh, to uh, co-struggle through. Yeah, it is. It is. And it's amazing how all those things kind of um, build on each other. The relationships we formed at the seminary, um, because we were, you know, in physically in proximity, we were close to each other in the same classrooms, mm -hmm. but we've been um, now we're all spread throughout the country. And, um, but for those, uh, for those bonds to last and manifest them in new ways, like with these, these, uh, fitness challenges that we're doing and I believe our yeah our next one's starting this Sunday and it's probably going this to Sunday this Sunday and it's going to yeah. carry us through Lent because uh let's kick it up a notch why not right. why not just do it do it during Lent um you that's know, right yeah of, of refocus anyway so um it's uh it's amazing how those things kind of coincide and we hear a lot in um the world today about being the better or the best version of yourself and most people look at that only from, uh, you know, a being physically fit way. But uh, in the Orthodox Church, of course, we wouldn't say we're trying to be the best version of ourselves, but maybe that we're trying to align ourselves with God in the best way possible. And that's when regular prayer and attendance of the services and fasting um, comes into play. And I, and I think that, you know, we find that when we do uh, align ourselves with God, we, we truly become the best version of ourselves. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Father Chris, uh, I can't thank you enough for being the first guest on. Oh, it's been great. Dude, I, I enjoyed this a lot. Um, you know, we've known each other probably, I think we actually met at summer camp. You were the boys director at St. Nicholas Ranch back in oh, the yeah. Day yeah. When, I was, when I was a counselor. And, um, you know, even though we've We've known each other for years. I learned a lot more about your personal journey um, towards the priesthood today. And I think um, a lot of people will have a lot of um, meaningful takeaways from the experiences, the, um, you know, the advice you've offered from your own personal path. And, um, and I can tell that uh, even though you are six years into ordained ministry, your years are only going to become more and more impactful as you go on and on. And so uh, we, we pray be blessed. 
Yeah, may be blessed. We pray for many years of um, fruitful ministry for you. And uh, thank you again, Father Chris. I, uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. And God bless this, uh, this program you're doing. I, I, I think it'll be a great uh, encouragement to a lot of uh, young people who are considering a uh, life in ministry, be it the priesthood or a life in uh, uh, parish leadership and ministry as well, uh, to consider uh, going to Helena College, Holy Cross, as, as a unique opportunity to strengthen themselves. And I would say, you know, in terms of my own story, uh, the only advice I would give in that is to um, pray about it quite a, quite a bit. You know, yeah. as St. Paul says, pray unceasingly. We should be praying all the time regardless, but pray, pray about your vocation. Um, and lean on those people that you you know, you love, you trust, spiritual father. Hopefully you have that in, uh, in place as well uh, to, to talk these things out. It's not going to – God willing, some of you might have that lightning bolt moment. That lightning yeah, right, moment right, where you get, the, you get the sign in the sky like St. Paul did. But a lot of us aren't, aren't given that uh, kind of flash moment right there. We have to discern. We have to, we have to brush aside some of the, the dirt and the things clouding up that uh, – that image there a little bit too. Uh, and so that is a process. That is a path as a, this path to the priest that you're talking about. Yeah. Very yeah. good. Very, very well said. Well, thank you, Father Chris. Uh, we thank wish you. And Kali Viname as we begin uh, Great Lent. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Kali Sarakosti for everyone. And um, we look forward to seeing everyone on our next podcast soon. Go All right. Have a good night. Mm -hmm.